Okay, so today we are going to talk about um, the connection between, and the fundamental theorem between its two parts. There's one part we've already talked about, that's the evaluation part. And now we're going to talk about the derivative part. How do derivatives and integrals, how are they connected? Okay, so we're going to look at a function and define it as an integral. So an integral can be a function. So then if an integral is a function, then we are going to find the derivative, excuse me, the derivative of the integral. And this will tie the concepts together. Now, last night for homework, you looked at graphs similar to this. This is one of the examples that you did. And this was a function that you were given, like for example here, such that this function represented an integral from 0 to x of f of t, where f of t, that's what's graphed here, or f of x, is the rate of snow falling. I think it's inches per hour, and we start off at zero, of course, and we have the rate of snow falling at one hour, two hours, three hours. The snow starts to melt, get a little more snowfall, and then it starts melting. So when we take the integral of a rate of change, we get the total amount of snow. So you guys filled out this table, and when you found the values of the integral of the rate of change, then you would take the area under the curve. So of course, zero to zero is always zero, but then the area under the curve from zero to one. Now the area under the curve from zero to two, we've accumulated now five inches of snow. Now we've accumulated six and a half inches of snow. Why does the amount of snow then decrease? Because the rate is decreasing and the snow is melting. The snow continues to melt. But then we get a little bit more snowfall and then a little bit and a little less and we just maintain that amount of snow, okay? Now, what is the difference between that and then the derivative of f of x? Well, if we think about it, if f of x is really a function, in other words, for every input, there is an output, which we looked at when we looked at this table. For every input, there was an output, input, output. So the capital F of x, which is a value of an integral, is a function. So if it's a function, then I should be able to take the derivative of both sides. So if I take the derivative of both sides, what is the result? Well, I get capital F prime of x, but then we take the derivative of an integral. Well, we know an integral is the antiderivative. So these two operations are inverses. And from algebra 1, we know the inverses will undo each other. So then we're just left with the function f of x. So the derivative of an integral is equal to what we call the integrand. Interesting. So the derivative of f of x is lowercase f of x. So the rate of snow falling is equivalent to the derivative of capital of f of x. So to find these values, I just look at the graph. So when x is 0, according to the graph, I have a y value of 1. When x is 1, I have a y value of 3, etc. Okay? Very important connection. Oh, quick review question. How would you find the average value of snow accumulated from 0 to 4? Do you remember that? Integral 0 to 4 of the function over interval. So how much snow was accumulated in the first four hours? Well, we accumulated 4 and a half inches of snow in the first four hours. So I would divide that number, and that would tell me the average value of snow in the first four hours. Nice application. Ah. Okay, moving right along. Now, in your homework tonight, you're going to be given a graph, and um, you're going to have to understand it, talk about it, dissect it. So this graph is f of x. So we notice that f of x is the integrand. And we are told that the position... So S of T represents the position of my particle it is the integral from 0 to T time of this function. Well, just like your homework, then you're going to first find the area under the curve because that's how you find values of integrals if you're given a graph. I won't do the whole thing, but just to start it off, we know that, well, from 0 to 0, that's always 0, right? So the position of my particle at the beginning of the race or whatever it starts at zero, the starting point. Then from zero to one in the first second of travel, I look at the curve. Zero to one, well, it's a triangle, one half base times height. One half times one is one half. So I moved over one half unit to the right. 
0 to 3, right? You remember this, right? 0 to 3. Now I'm going to find the area into the curve. Well, 3 times 3 is 9, divided by 2 is 9 halves, or 4.5. So that means now the position of the particle is 4.5 units to the right. And we could keep going. Now, that's the position of the particle, okay? Now, what happens if I take the derivative of s of x? So if I take the derivative of one side, I have to take the derivative of the other side. Well, what happens when you take a derivative of an integral? They're opposite inverse operations. So the derivative of an integral is going to be the actual integrand. So the derivative is equal to f of x. Well, what's the derivative of position? It's velocity. So this graph here is the derivative of position or velocity at any time t. Okay? So now you should be able to answer such questions as, what is the particle velocity at t equals 5? Well, I would just look at my graph. Let me erase this so I've got some space now. Okay? I've got a lot of going on here. Okay? Let me pick a different color. How about blue? So the velocity at t equals 5, so I just go over 5 here. This is the velocity graph. So I'm moving 2 units per second. That's my rate of change. Um, what is the acceleration? Ooh, acceleration is the slope of velocity. So what is the slope right here? What is that slope, okay, at t equals 5? Well, they're just asking, is it positive or negative? Well, if I look at that, we have a negative slope. So that means the acceleration is negative. What is the particle's position at t equals 3? Well, since this is velocity, to find the position, I would take the integral. And we looked at that already. The position is 4.5 units to the right. So you take the integral. At what time during the first 9 seconds, okay, so from 0 to 9, does s, that means position, have its largest value? So I'm looking at the value of the integral. That means area under the curve. Well, if I just look at this graph, when is the area under the curve going to be the largest? Well, it's going to be the largest here at 6. Because once I pass 6, then it's going to be a negative value, so it's going to take away from the first 6 seconds. So at t equals 6, I will have the largest value for s. So a couple problems like this will be in your homework. You'll need to answer those and be able to justify them in class. Now, we've been looking at the graphical approach in relating derivatives to integrals, okay? And you guys have understood this concept that if I have an integral, now this is a specific, this is called a definite integral because you're told it goes from 0 to 1. But if I have a function that is an integral, I can find values for x such that it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So therefore, we can take the derivative of both sides, and we have learned that the derivative of capital F of x is equal to the integrand, which is f of t, or when we substitute, evaluate it in terms of x, which is f of x. Now, I'm going to show you this a little bit graphically. We'll connect it to the algebra, okay? But let's say that we were to graph this information given. Well, not graph, I'm sorry, find the in-out table. So you are given the graph below. Haha, <laughs> I need to graph the graph below. So at 0, we have 0. At 1, um, let's see, my graph looks something like this, okay? Here's the graph given to you. Wait, am I graphing that right? No, I am not. It's important to have the right graph. Okay, actually, right there. So it goes up, goes down, and then it goes down, and then up. Okay? So you're given this fact. This is the graph. We're told it has an odd symmetry. That means it's symmetrical about the origin, and it's periodic. Every two units, it's going to repeat itself. So then I know that if it's symmetric about the origin, then it's going to look like this. Okay? Now the other fact I'm told is that the area under the curve from 0 to 1 is 4 thirds. So I know that this value here is 4 thirds. Well, understanding all of that, then, we can define capital F of x to be the value of the integral from 0 to x. So we would be able to make an in-out table. Well, we're told that from 0 to 1, the value is 4 thirds. Okay? And we know that whenever we evaluate from 0 to 0, that value is going to be 0. 
What about negative 1? You had one like this on your homework. So if I'm going from 0 to negative 1 of this function, okay, well, you notice immediately that the limits are not in the correct order. So it's actually going to be the opposite from negative 1 to 0 of this function. So let's look at the graph and find the, the value of the um, area between the graph and the x-axis. Well, we can see here that that's a negative 4 thirds, right? Because it's below the x-axis. So then the opposite of negative 4 thirds would be a positive 4 thirds. So then at negative 1, the value of capital F of x is positive 4 thirds. Now looking at the graph, this is a 4 thirds, but this would be a negative 4 thirds. So from 0 to 2, the value of the integral is 0. And then if I were to continue and go to 3, I would have 4 thirds. So we have just um, created an xy table for this function. So capital F of x is indeed a function. We could therefore take the derivative of this function. Okay? Now, let's connect this. So let's say that we are told capital F of x is the function cosine of t evaluated from 0 to x. Well, what is the derivative of f of x? So if I take the derivative, since it's a function, we know we can take the derivative of both sides. Well, we've learned that we can evaluate, we know the value of cosine evaluated from x to 0 x, right? So wait, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Let me go over here and show my work a little bit clearer. So capital F of x is equal to the function of 0 to x of cosine t of dt. Now, since we're given a specific function, we can actually use the first part of the fundamental theorem and evaluate it. So we would take the antiderivative of cosine, which is sine of t, and then evaluate it from x to 0. So we would get sine of x minus sine of 0. And we know that sine of 0 is 0. So the value of capital F of x is sine of x. So this is looking at it from an algebraic perspective. Now, if I take the derivative of both sides, so the derivative of capital F of x is going to be equal to the derivative of sine of x. Well, what's the derivative of sine of x? Cosine of x. Huh, interesting. And then what we've been talking about is that when we take the derivative of the left side, we must take the derivative of the right side, right? And we've been realizing from our graph that when you take the derivative of an integral, they're inverse operations. So this results in the integrand evaluated at x. So that's what we notice graphically. And then this is the graphical idea. And then look at, when we look at it algebraically, we get the same concept. So the derivative of an integral is equal to the integrand. Now that is a big moment. Yes, it is. So you have a yellow resource page that has this stated. So, theor so in general notation, when we take the derivative of an integral, that's evaluated. Now A represents a constant. If you have a constant as the lower limit, and the integral then has a variable as the upper limit, so it's a function. So when we take the derivative of an integral, that's a function, it will result as the integrand evaluated at that variable. Da -da -dum. We have just proved it. Now a couple simple problems to apply this. So let's say we want to find the derivative of this function, which is an integral. Now notice we have a constant as a lower limit, and we have a variable as the upper limit. According to what we've just learned, the derivative of an integral is the integrand, which is 5t squared minus 6t plus 1, evaluated at x. So this would result in 5x squared minus 6x plus 1. Wow, is it really that easy? Yes, it is. Now, I could prove this to you. Now, I want you to write this proof in your notes. So how does it work? So we know that from 3 to x of 5 of t squared minus 6t plus 1 dt. 
we could prove this because we know how to find the antiderivative. So we would add a 3, so I'd get 5 thirds t cubed minus 6 t squared over 2 plus t, and we're going to evaluate it from x to 3, okay? Now if I continue with this, I get 5 thirds x cubed, I'm substituting the x in, minus 6 x squared over 2 plus x, and then I have to subtract, now I have to put the 3 in, 5 thirds 3 cubed minus 6 3 squared over 2 plus 3. Okay, so now I'm going to do the mathematics here, and I end up, of course, 5 thirds x cubed minus 3 x squared plus x, and then what in the heck's going on here? Well, 3 cubed is 27, um, divided by 3 is 9, so this would be minus, so this would be a 45, and then 3 squared is 9 times 6 is 54, divided by 2 is 27 plus 3. So 45 minus 27 plus 3, so 48 minus 27, 41, 21. Did I get that right? Oh, I sure hope I did. Minus 21. Okay, but this is what my function is equal to, right? But I wanted to take the derivative of that function. So if I take the derivative of both sides, then the derivative, right, you bring the 3 in the front, so the 3s will undo each other, and you subtract 1, so I get 5x squared. Bring the 2 in the front, so I get negative 6x plus 1, and the derivative of a constant is just 0. So look, the derivative of my integral is 5x squared minus 6x plus 1. Oh my word, yes, it all works together, okay? But I don't have to go through this proof every time because we have understood and developed the idea of the fundamental theorem that the derivative of the integral is the integrand. Yes. So now in these problems, we can make it much simpler. So the derivative of the integral is the integrand because we have a constant here. We have a variable here. So the derivative of an integral is the integrand evaluated at the constant. So this would just be cosine of x. Nice, huh? Same thing here. We have a variable um, constant. So the derivative of the integral at the, at the variable is going to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. Nice. You have just completed your lesson um, for today. Now make sure you answer the questions on your Google form.